So uh, about SF Tech, we are a professional entrepreneurial Canadian company. We're based in Montreal, Quebec. We specialize in the business of composite rebar, which is basically fiber reinforced polymers, whether it's glass, uh, carbon, or doesn't matter which one. All of our products are designed here in Canada and are manufactured in Shandong, uh, China. Our partners manufacturing partner is Shandong Safety Industries, who are also a leader uh, uh, in the industry uh, for the manufacturing uh, and the composite. Uh. Here in Canada, we also are partners with the University of Sherbrooke, um, who help us a lot with the research and development. Uh, and they work with us to ensure that our products are compliant with the CSA standards in Canada and the ACI standards in the US. And they also provide us with their feedback on how to improve the products, the technology, and so on. Uh, so the University of Sherbrooke uh, labs are run under uh, the supervision of uh, uh, Professor Brahim Ben Mokran. Uh, we also are partners with the ENSER, which is the National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada, along with other memberships, including the NPCA, the National Precast Association, and so on. Uh, we work also on diverse markets. We try to focus our attention on engineers. Uh, we like to work with structural engineers for infrastructure projects. So we participated in the design uh, of different projects, including waffle slabs, including um, regular slabs, water purification stations, retaining walls, ICF walls. Uh, we work on these projects with the engineering community. Uh, however, we, we had a lot of success also with non-structural applications like slab on grades and so on. So this is where we basically, because we are heavy on science, we try to work with engineers as much as we can. However, we, we try not to miss the opportunity in the non-structural slab on grade market uh, that, that can be a little bit of a interesting in a sense that we're able to provide a superior product at a more competitive price. So for those of you who, who are a little bit new to the fiber uh, reinforced polymers, so what you're seeing here uh, in this picture, you're seeing like a fiber under a microscope. So it's basically the bars are made of fibers and the, and the polymer matrix that basically holds up the fiber together through an interface. So if you look here at the picture on the right, you see the resins here, which are the polymers. And then you see the, the fibers, which are uh, those here, the, the circles, and the interface basically is uh, just those white things that connect the polymer with the, the fibers. So this creates, as you can see from this uh, diagram, uh, it creates a very strong bar or material. If you compare the glass fiber or any fiber to steel, you will notice that even the glass fiber, which is considered the weakest compared to aramid or, uh, or carbon, in terms of tensile strength, it is still two to three times stronger than steel. However, also this diagram shows uh, that steel shows some yielding, while fibers in general, they are linear up to failure, which means that they don't give signs. And that's why they have, uh, they don't give signs of failure, they're sudden failure, uh, which means the codes to design with fiberglass are completely different than the codes uh, to design uh, with fibers in general, sorry, uh, are different than those codes to design with steel. And this is why we are doing those monthly webinars to familiarize engineers and, and uh, professionals in, do, in, in the design strategies, uh, how to follow the code and design accordingly. So some of our products, um, obviously we do, the, the biggest product is the fiberglass bars. Uh, we can do bent bars, uh, we can do spirals. Uh, uh, those things on the, on the right are shear connectors, very popular in the precast uh, applications for sandwich walls. Uh, we also um, have, uh, we introduced just late last year, we introduced two more products, which are uh, to the left is the carbon fiber for restorations, columns and foundation walls and so on. And to the right is the fiberglass fibers, which are great for crack control. So it goes with the concrete mix while you're mixing the concrete and it helps a lot with the crack control. So uh, why should you use uh, 
SFT bars and products in general, uh, uh, the GFRP bars uh, instead of steel bars, first, you, you can expect a longer service life. It's expected to outlast steel by about three times. It has an improved durability in harsh marine conditions. So we, a lot of the engineers' inquiries for fiberglass, we see them trying to work, for, for example, on uh, parking garages because there's a lot of the icing material. But that's not the only. We, we have a lot of application, as you can see, in marine environments. So a lot of the engineers are designing, for example, retaining walls and stuff like that. And, and this is where they feel that fiberglass has the advantage of, of steel uh, on the short and long run. The advantageous uh, corrosion uh, resistance. Um, one of the big advantages, obviously, of fiberglass, and this is why it's favorable in, in marine conditions, is because it resists corrosion. Um, and uh, that makes it very easy to work with in, in different applications. It also uh, has a greater tensile strength, like we, show, we showed in previous slides. And uh, in terms of weight, it's about one quarter to one fifth the density of steel, which means uh, the worker who's capable of carrying five steel bars on his shoulder, theoretically he's able to carry 15 to 20 steel bars. Uh, sorry, fiberglass bars because of the weight. So that contributes definitely to less fatigue on the job site and, and better productive. It goes back again to the no corrosion. Uh, we've seen engineers also trying to specify the product into, uh, for example, pipelines, uh, water purification stations, and, and even parking garages, as I mentioned, they, they can be harsh on, on steel. Uh, because of the de-icing material in, in uh, countries like Canada. Uh, one huge advantage is that it's neutral to, to magnetic fields and electrical. Uh, it's a perfect application for airports, MRI rooms, maybe military applications um, where you don't want to be detected uh, also. And I think uh, that would be, oh no, there's one more. Uh, it's definitely, it's more bi uh, ecological uh, then steel to produce steel. There, there's a lot of mining involved. And then for shaping the steel, you have to heat it and, and so on for the fabrication process. Fiberglass is first, it's, it's most importantly, it's recyclable. And uh, the other thing, the embodied energy to produce fiberglass is much lower uh, than steel. On top of that, it's not something uh, that is mined to, to be able to produce. Uh, and that's it. I'll take the chance to uh, give the mic to Dr. Yassin. While we're switching screens, I'll give you a little bit of introduction about uh, Dr. Yassin. So Dr. Yassin, um, uh, he is a structural uh, engineer, um, not in Canada, he's a structural engineer by education. He came to Canada a few years ago and continued his PhD in civil engineering in the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, so he's an expert in, um, in, in, in the field that he's going to be talking about. He also received the Master's of Technology in Structural Engineering from the University of Tehran before coming to, uh, to Canada. And of course, before that, he had to have his Bachelor's of Engineering from um, uh, also Iran, from University of Urmia. He worked there as a, as a, as a civil engineer lecturer uh, at Saba Institute of Higher Education and as a structural engineer at Tarhi uh, Andishan, No Andishan, uh, consulting firm uh, in Iran. Um, Yassin uh, joined uh, SF Tech as a researcher and an expert in the domain uh, back in uh, June 2020, uh, May or June 2020. And he basically, during his uh, work with us, he did work on several projects, including Waffle Slabs, obviously, uh, other slab projects and also uh, ICF walls and, and precast walls and all these things. Um, he is currently a MITAX postdoctoral fellow at the University of Sherbrooke, along with being uh, with us at SF Tech. And his re research interest also includes uh, the behavior, behavioral of uh, structural uh, concrete reinforced with fiberglass, with fiber uh, polymers, uh, and the testing, the characterization of FRP materials, and the durability analysis uh, of reinforced uh, structures. So I would like to 
hand the mic to Dr. Yassin, and uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Rick, for your nice presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Yassin. I'm going to present a presentation titled GFRP Reinforced Waffle Slabs. The outlines of the presentation includes introduction to structural slabs, one-way slabs, and two-way slabs. Then we are going to talk about analysis methods and design concepts of two-way slabs. Then we are going to focus on the design controlling factors of waffle slabs. Then the presentation will be followed with a case study. And at the end, we are going to demonstrate a real field application of GFRP bars in a waffle slab. Introduction. Slabs can be considered as um, structural members that they are, um, they have smaller thickness compared to their width and length. And the simplest form of a slab is the one that is supported on two sides in two opposite sides and they deflect in one direction and transfer, transform their loads into um, two directions. And uh, they call them, um, it's referred as one way slab. And when the slab is supported on four sides, they, are, they can deflect in two directions and they transfer the loads in four directions. And this kind of slab they call they are referred as uh, two two-way slabs. And when the the bending moment and the deflection in two-way slabs in each direction is less than one-way slab. This means that when the slab is supported in four uh, sides, they can carry more loads. The schematic drawing in the slide this slide shows the way that the one-way slab can um, transfer the load to the support. The one-way slab transfers in two uh, way in the short direction. And in two-way slab, they, sub they transfer the load in four directions, as you see. Technically, the one-way slab can be separate, uh, can be dis distinguished from two-way slab by the ratio of longer span to shorter span, which when it is more than two, uh, we can consider it as one base slab. When the ratio of longer span to shorter span is less than two, we can consider it as two way slab. Different type of one way slab exists. To name a few, there we have flat slabs that the slab is uh, supported on two beams, and the span length that they can cover is between 10 to 20 feet, and the live load is 60 to 100 uh, pounds per square feet. And for one-way slab joist floor system, this pan length that we can consider is uh, 20 to 30 feet, and the live load is between 80 to 120 pound per square feet. Similarly, for two-way slab, we have different type of slabs. From na to name them from weakest to the strongest, flat plates that are supported on columns only, they can um, cover a span length of 20 from 20 to 25 feet. And the live load that they can bear is 60 to 100 PSF. The flat slab that they can, they, they're supported on the drop panels or the column caps or either of each uh, uh, these elements. Um, they can cover a span length between 20 to 30 feet and the live load of 80 to 150 PSF. The, Slabs on beams, they can cover a, a span length between 20 to 30 feet and live load of 60 to 120. And at last, the waffle slab that they can cover a span length between 30 to 48 feet and the live load between 80 to 150 um, PSF. Waffle slabs, they have particular features that I'm going to uh, name a few of them. Like they, uh, the ribs are normally they're uh, intersecting each other in right angle. And uh, on top of the columns, we have a solid head that uh, prevents the slab from punching shear. The solid uh, column head is, um, excuse me, normally these uh, slabs are constructed without beams, but we also can consider um, beams that they, uh, usually they are uh, uh, very uh, shallow and uh, wide and they, they are centered in the 
uh, column uh, center lines. So uh, the voids inside the uh, slab is uh, made by voids that they're made by square metals and fi fiberglass pans, and uh, these form the joists. And there is a three to five uh, inch thickness of the slab on top of the joist that they using this slab, the joist will form a, a T section and this saves considerable amount of concrete. The new versions of this kind of slabs, and uh, they're called Kobiox uh, floor system that instead of using square pans, they're using uh, balls. And also in U-boot systems, floor systems, they use square pans, but these pans are left inside the concrete after casting and they don't remove them. So you won't see a, a void under the floor system. But the difference between these two uh, system with the waffle slab, they are a little bit expensive than waffle slab, but they are faster in construction. Analysis methods and design concepts of two-way slabs. Uh, because of indeterminate nature of uh, two-way slabs, exact analysis of forces and displacements of these kind of slabs is uh, really complex to obtain, even when we neglect the effect of creep and nonlinear behavior of the concrete. Uh, for that reason, ACI 318 let, um, uh, allows us to use uh, numerical methods such as finite element methods, but also they introduce uh, uh, two different methods that they are really uh, suitable for practical purposes. In chapter eight, they assume that the slabs behave like a white and shallow beams and that forms a column above and that forms a rigid frame with the columns above and below them. So the methods that they uh, use is direct design method, the first one, which uh, needs uh, certain conditions to be able to apply for the prop and for the uh, design purpose. And these conditions are the columns should have nearly equal uh, spacing from each other. And also the um, load on the slab should be uniformly distributed. The uh, method that um, they use is to they uh, give a few um, coefficients to to distribute the load on the frame, and so the frame is divided into two two sections, and the one that is covering the columns is called uh, column strip, and the one that is covered with the um, covering the rest of the panel is called the middle strip. And the second frame, uh, the second method that they use, uh, they have introduced is equivalent frame method. And this is a kind of method that is divine, dividing a three dimensional building into two dimensional building, uh, uh, the two dimensional frame. And it cuts the uh, frame of the floor by the lines in midway between the columns and uh, uh, consider each floor separately. Now we are going through a, a case study that we have, uh, we try to design with GFRP bar for, uh, for calculating the capacity of the uh, slab and uh, for ultimate strengths. Um, excuse me, for the ultimate limited states. This is the plan of the uh, case study that we have considered. The spacing between the columns is 30 foot and the columns dimensions is 20 by 20 inch. And the dimensions of the solid heads that are considered for this project is uh, 12 feet by 12 feet. The cross section of the waffle slab that is considered for this project is as is shown in the schematic drawing here. The spacing of the joist is 36 inch. The joist thickness is six inch. The height of the joist is 14 inch. The thickness of the slab above the joist is 4.5 inch. The thickness, the total uh, height of the buffle slab is 18.5 inch. The void inside the table below shows the uh, cross-sectional geometric properties of the slab. 
the void inside the uh, waffle slab is uh, calculated to be um, 6.454 cubic feet. The spacing of the uh, between the solid heads is 18 feet. And uh, as we said before, 12 by 12 is the solid head. The design would be based on ACR 440 in uh, 2050. And the assumptions of the uh, problem is we consider a dead load of 50 uh, pound per square feet, excluding the sulfate, and the live load is 100 PSF. The concrete cover is 0 0.75 inch. The concrete uh, strength is 5 KSI, and the modulus of elasticity is uh, 4,000 uh, KSI. The, Concrete is a normal concrete, and we have used GFRP type 2, which refers to modulus of velocity of 50 gigapascal. And uh, in order to calculate the loads, the effective loads on the uh, slab, we uh, assuming that the um, density of the concrete is uh, 150 pound per cubic feet. Uh, the dead load of the solid head would be calculated as 277.5 PSF. The, for the ripped area, this value for the self weight of the uh, ripped area is calculated to be 146.7 PSF. Uh, by calculating the factored loads for the slab, we need to add the uh, effect of self weight to this. So for the solid part, we will have a, um, a uniform load in the surface of uh, 500 PSF and uniform load in the ripped area is 370 PSF. To bring this surface loading to a linear uniform load on the panel, to consider it, it like a, a beam, we need to um, multiply this to the effective area of each uh, panel. So for the solid head, we have 12.66 kips per feet uh, uniform load. And for the ripped area is 11.1 kip per foot uh, load, uh, uniform load. And uh, now having these uh, loads, we can calculate the shear at the face of the column. So at the face of the column, the shear force is 165.3 kips. And also we can calculate the midispan uh, moment, which is 1,135 kips foot. So the schematic drawing here shows the uh, uniform load uh, uh, acting on the uh, panel and the shear force that uh, is produced on the panel at the face of the column. Uh, face of the column is 165k, and at the face of the um, solid head is 100k, and the moment uh, in the mid span is 100 uh, 1135k uh, feet. The punching shear uh, controls the design. So uh, first to start with that. Um, we need to first find the um, uh, critical section for the punching shear, which would be a half D away from the surface of the uh, column. Uh, in our, we assume that we have used a bar number six GFRP bars to design. This means that the diameter of the bar is 0 0.787 uh, inch. The ultimate strength is 100 megapascal, which means 145 KSI. And the and depth of the rain, effective depth of reinforcement would be calculated as 17.3 inch. And the perimeter of the uh, critical section would be 149 inch. So we can calculate the strength, uh, the shear load at the punching shear at the critical section. So the uh, shear load at the critical section will be calculated as is here and would be 346 kips. And after calculating the shear load, we need to know how much strength would be, would be provided at the 
by the by the concrete at the critical section. So to do that, we need these values that uh, this is the um, balanced reinforcement for GFRP. And we assume that we had a, a 0.95 times the uh, reinforcement ratio of the balance uh, at the solid head. So 0.0044 would be our reinforcement ratio. and. Uh, uh, reduction factor of the uh, capacity of shear is 0 0.75 according to the ACI 440. And the ratio of the modulus of velocity to modulus of velocity of, con modulus of, velocity of uh, uh, FRP to concrete would be 1.799. And if we calculate the K, K factor, it's gonna be 0 0.112 which is less than 0 0.16. According to the research, we don't need to uh, get take it below 0 0.16. So the capacity of the uh, concrete uh, for shear, punching shear would be, uh, after adding the um, reduction factor would be 220 kips. And this is, is less than uh, the, load, the punching shear load at the critical section. So we need to provide uh, more strength using GFRP bars. So uh, in order to calculate the uh, shear provided by the uh, GFRP stirrups, first we need to calculate the um, concrete strength, but this time with this formula, because the um, um, now we are providing the shear stirrup. So this formula would change into this. Then um, the ultimate uh, F, um, strength of the uh, stirrups would be calculated as 0 0.004 multiplied by um, modulus of elasticity of uh, uh, FRP, which would be 29.008 KSI. The, this value should be shouldn't be more than the value uh, provided by the uh, bending portion of the stirrups, which is not. So we are okay. Then we assume that the stirrups would be provided at five inch spacing from each other. So by having this spacing, we can calculate the reinforcement required for this GFRP bars. Uh, so this reinforcement would be uh, for all four uh, sides of the column. These uh, sides would, we need to calculate the um, reinforcement area in one side. So for doing that, we need to divide it by four. Then we need to uh, know the reinforcement area required by each leg of the stirrup. Then again, we divide it by four. So we ass assume that we use a number four bar at five inch. Uh, spacing from each other, then uh, this will provide sufficient strength to the to the section. Then uh, we need to check whether this five inch is not more than our maximum um, reinforcement spacing. So it should be more than half uh, D or 20 inch, which is because we the maximum is 8.6. So we have provided five. So it, we are less than the maximum allowable. So that's okay. Then we need to calculate the uh, shear strength provided by the stirrup, which is 322.1 kips. The, um, uh, shear strength provided by the uh, sum of uh, fiber and also the um, concrete would be sufficient enough to provide the uh, enough strength for our loading at the current at the critical section um, but there are a few uh, other controls that we need to do uh, According to the code, if uh, the strength provided by the stirrup shouldn't be more than three times the strength of the uh, concrete. So uh, if this is true, then we can use this uh, reduction factor. Otherwise, the um, based on probabilistic studies, the uh, reduction factor would be uh, different. So in order to keep everything conservative, this should be uh, less than the, uh, the strength provided by the FRP should be less than three times the uh, 
capacity of the concrete. So it's okay, as you see, uh, I have calculated and three times the uh, capacity of concrete is for, for 40 kips. And then uh, the strength provided by the FRP is 322 kips. And then also we have this control of uh, shear failure due to crushing of the web. And this was uh, also okay. As you see, the our maximum, uh, our uh, shear capacity provided is less than this uh, expression, the value of this expression. Then at the, again, at the um, um, face of the solid head, we need to, again, check the um, uh, punching shear. So at the, uh, face of the solid head uh, uh, is the rib area. So the geometry is different. So in order to make the things easier, the, uh, we change the uh, thickness of the, we change the geometry into a flat plate form. And then uh, this transformation would be based on equalizing, uh, based on mass. And then uh, we can consider that uh, if we equalize this, uh, those two sections with each other, we will add a 2.33 inch to 4.5 inch uh, thickness of uh, that we had provided on top of the joist. So the effective uh, reinforcement depth would be 5.6 inch. Then the uh, uh, perimeter of the critical sections this time is 598. If we calculate the shear load at that um, section is 273. And if we uh, conservatively consider this uh, added uh, um, flat plate, we will see that the um, shear strength provided for sh um, uh, this section at the face of the uh, solid head is sufficient. After calculating the uh, shear punching shear, we need to calculate the uh, reinforcement ratio for the uh, uh, sections. Uh, we are going to use the total, we are going to use the uh, direct design method of ACI 318. So we had the um, total factored moment in the mid span. So this mid span was uh, first was distributed to the uh, panel, then after distributing to the panel, with other coefficients, we are distributing to the uh, column strip and then from uh, also to the middle strip. So by doing that, by, to start with, we are going to start with the end span, the negative moment in the interior section, uh, the critical, uh, uh, at the critical section, the moment is equal to 601 foot keep. And um, so we assume that we are using a tension control uh, section and the ultimate strength of the uh, FRP, as we said before, is 100 megapascal. And uh, uh, by adding the, by multiplying to the uh, environmental coefficient for interior uh, applications, we get a 116 KSI. And uh, we are using type 2 uh, GFRP. So Assuming that GFR number six GFRP is used in the um, section, uh, we can calculate the uh, effective depth of the uh, reinforcement, which is 17.3 inch. The ultimate strength of the GFRP is 0 0.016, and the CB value is the balance. Uh, the depth of the neutral X at the balance conditions is 2.74. And if we place this value in the our uh, formula for uh, required reinforcement uh, for tension control sections, we will get 6.95 inch square inch, which seems to be less than minimum reinforcement. We are going to check it. Minimum reinforcement is equal to uh, is can be obtained using this formula of ACR 440. And this uh, shouldn't be more than uh, 0.0036. So uh, reinforcement ratio at the minimum reinforcement ratio would be equal to 0 0.036, 0 0.0036. And um, a, um, so the reinforcement uh, required reinforcement area of the section would be 9.59 squared inch. 
And if we can consider a spacing of 6.5 inch for the uh, reinforcement, it's going to be 9.752, which is more than the required value. So we are going to use the minimum section, minimum uh, uh, reinforcement sec reinforcement for GFRP. And for another section, which is the mid span at the which is the end span positive uh, moment, we have uh, three. 151 foot keep moment there. So in order to calculate the required reinforcement for this section, we need to, again, calculate the effective, uh, we need to calculate the, again the CB value. And this CB value, if we place it in the our uh, formula, it's going to give us 4.09 square feet um, uh, reinforcement area this is the required reinforcement area. And we know that we have put two uh, GFRP in the, uh, each joist. So we need to know how many joists we have in the other uh, column strip. This column strip consists of five um, joists. So we have to multiply the uh, reinforcement provided in each joist by five to calculate the uh, required reinforcement uh, the to calculate the provided reinforcement. Then the uh, reinforcement provided reinforcement, if it is compared to uh, balanced reinforcement, we will see that it's uh, tension control. So the assumption was correct. At the mid span, the uh, minimum reinforcement is, uh, according to the code, is calculated by the formula and it shouldn't be. Uh, less than 0 0.0014, and it shouldn't be more than 0 0.0036. So the reinforcement is, uh, we need to consider this value as the reinforcement ratio for uh, our uh, beam, for our slab. So this uh, minimum reinforcement is equal to 2.916. And uh, for the depth, for the, this was calculated for the thickness on the top of the slab. So we are putting this uh, reinforcement on the top of the joist. So uh, and the minimum reinforcement is also uh, for 12 inch spacing from each other is 2.999. So um, we provided number four GFRP at 12 inch on top of the positive uh, moment and at each choice, uh, number number six, two number six bars. Okay, uh, so the uh, reinforcement for moment uh, is calculated for each critical section, and I'm not going to go through uh, all. Just uh, as an example of what I have done is uh, I'm showing you as in a schematic drawing and uh, the. Comparison between steel reinforcement with the one that um, we use as a GFRP reinforcement would be for a identical loading condition. The, um, reinfor the steel reinforcement would need only 17 inch uh, thickness of wall, a uh, thickness of slab, and the span length could be increased to 33 feet. And concrete strength is enough to control the punching shirt. This is why the GFRP reinforcement requires 18.5 inch um, uh, height of depth of the slab and the span length is 30 feet and requires using stirrups to control punching shear. Uh, but what's the point of using GFRP? As we said before, Rick uh, gave a more comprehensive uh, uh, explanation of why we are using GFRP. Uh, just to, main, uh, to mention a few of those advantages of using GFRP, GFRP would have a, a and um, cheaper price compared to steel and it's lightweight and so construction would be easier and less expensive compared to steel and the durability in durability aspect GFRP has better uh, results and it's non-corrosive and uh, also it requires less concrete cover compared to GFRP and uh, so we should think in a different way when we are uh, calculate when we are using GFRP, not to see if it is uh, 
sufficient for capacity or no. So we need to think in general about the construction. So a field application of this uh, GFRP bars is a project that is uh, constructed in Nova Scotia, Canada. So the, uh, as you see, the GFRP bars are used in the field. The references that I have used in the, my uh, presentation. And thank you very much for your uh, attendance and giving me the time to present this presentation to you.